Okay. Yeah, so thank you so much, everyone, for attending to today's panel discussion, OSPOs in Regulated Environments. Uh, one of our speakers wasn't able to join in person, so he's doing that virtually. Uh, but before getting into, into this, uh, his presentation, his introduction, let's introduce the in-person speakers we have with him. From They have experience in uh, various industries, and I think that it's a really good group that we have here to serve uh, like the different knowledge and the different experience they have had in their respective industries and their experience in the past. So um, I have with me, I think, well, the better way we can do it is introduce uh, itself. So Claire, do you want to? Thank you, Anna. Um, so my name is Claire Dillon. Uh, I'm coming for, for here, I'm here today with a number of hats on. So um, uh, up until recently, I was the executive director of Intersource Commons. Uh, and with Intersource Commons, uh, we worked with a number of folks who were based in both open source program offices and Intersource program offices. Um, but m more recently, I have become a researcher, um, starting my PhD with the University of Galway, um, and I'm sitting in uh, Lero's OSPO in, um, in the uh, S uh, Science Foundations Ireland's uh, Software Development Research Centre. Um, and also, I, for the last number of years, I've been working with uh, folks who are involved in OSPOs in universities and the academic setting. That one works. <laughs> okay, maybe I have to find a button. Uh, I do electro uh, electrical engineering, but electronics apparently uh, is difficult. Uh, I work at a grid operator in the Netherlands. We do electricity and gas distribution uh, for a third of the Dutch households. Um, and um, my background in, in university was in electrical engineering, so I, I come from engineering. At the time, there wasn't really much open source being developed in the field. And I have to say that that has changed over the years, and we are actively doing that at Aliander, developing the software that we need for the energy transition, because we cannot do it ourselves. We don't often know the use case or the regulatory framework yet. That has to be developed on the pilot projects themselves. And so we're really active collaborating with other organizations to come up with the software that we need or think we need. Uh, and my involvement is at the Open Source Program Office there. I have to share back. Uh, my name is Thomas Steenbergen. Um, I currently help organizations with all kinds of things open source. I have a background basically working in the automotive industry, uh, where basically to, you know, we have, again, we have electrification, we have self-driving car. Basically, the amount of software in the car is going 50-fold in the next two years and probably 100-fold in the next uh, three years after. And so, yeah, you, you can't write all that yourself, so you need to use open source. And basically, I've been working on like how do we facilitate this. So I've been working on open source policies, processes, and tooling so that in the supply chain, we all could basically manage open source better. Um, and I'm Ana Jimenez. I'm the program manager at Tudor Group, that is an open group of practi practitioners uh, willing to build best practices and tooling on build effective and sustainable open source program offices. So uh, I, I'm not part of the OSPO, but I've been engaging with a lot of organizations from the tech sector and from regulated industries also building the OSPO. Um, so I, I think I, I already have one question that when you were introducing its, its out of background, I think uh, might be interesting to address, that is, uh, when building the OSPO, uh, I guess it's not as easy or it's kind of different from building an OSPO in a traditional software industry because they have their regulations, the specific challenges. What, what would you say were your concrete challenges when building the OSPO in your industry, specific industry, or when assisting other OSPOs to, to build um, open source initiatives? Uh, that you think are were like the more critical ones? Yeah, um, our, our main uh, drive to start an OSPO in the first place was innovation, was tackling the issues that we have. So it wasn't about license compliance because we don't really ship software. So in, in that sense, it's really different than a traditional software company. We also don't have a legacy of, of self-built software, so most of the software that we build uh, is heavily dependent on open source uh, already. So ensuring that it's uh, compliant in terms of security and uh, the functionality is important. 
and then really getting the, the collaboration going with other companies, uh, other organizations, with the universities for research uh, to make, uh, to, get, yeah, to get successful projects. So yeah, in automotive, again, but I think most of the regulated industries that I work for, they're regulated. So in a tech company for a lot of things, yeah, there might be processes and you can just change them. In regulated industry, you know, there is a process and the process is the process. And if you come with something like open source that cuts through all of that, you need to convince a lot of people to be like, yeah, I know technically you cover all of security and all of safety, but this is like open source, so I now want to have a carve out. And, but also a simple, like I remember the first meeting that we had between the three car manufacturers is like, we had to have lawyers present for cartel stuff. And like, we had a whole piece of paper for antitrust for all the things because, no, 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 the three car manufacturers cannot be in the room together without a lot of lawyers being present. So luckily, there is somebody called Mike Dolan from the Linux Foundation, <laughs> and he says like, you guys are all Linux Foundation members. We can just call this a Linux Foundation if a membership meetup, and then everybody agrees to these rules from LF, and that's how we come up. But again, it, then again, all the layers had to agree. I will, I will add to that, 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 you know, so I think what you've described is that the regulatory, regulated industries have put all these regulations that you have to consider on top of things, and sometimes you can find your way around them, and then in certain scenarios, the, the community might be so diverse, and um, with different players, with different motivations, that it almost becomes a, a too, too big of a thorny problem to actually you know, change any of those processes. And so you're, so in many respects, sometimes in the university setting, with the regulation around things like grants and all the, all the various different ways you have to actually justify exactly what you do, how you do it, um, it, it does become a very, very hard problem to get consistency in the approach across what might be a range of actors, um, many of whom may not even know what open source is, and, and then trying to do that across multiple institutions for inter-institution collaborations and things like that, um, can, can be, again, even more complex than even doing it within the context of one regulated, you know, and one industry, one, sorry, one company within a regulated industry. So, yeah, lots of complexity. Mm. Uh, one thing that I now remind, uh, you were mentioning about convincing all the different stakeholders, um, and I'm worried and, and, and wondering uh, to know about like how, for instance, do you in your industries have you convince uh, the different stakeholders like, for instance, an open source project that wasn't intended to be that for that specific purpose can be used and still be used and they can we can like the industry so participate and collaborate and like how i don't know if you have faced that issue before to how to convince these uh different people that maybe they need this extra understanding in the culture of open source to yes this open source project is working and you should be contributing to it even though the main like the initially it wasn't intended for that specific purpose for that industry but it can be adapted yeah, um, we call it dual purpose <laughs> regulations, and it's really, really complicated. Uh, because you get approval for one thing, and then it changes, and this is where regulated industries are very risk averse. So when this happens, you might get a panic event, where like, well, no, 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 we open source this for, I don't know, collaboration with this other partner. And now this other company, this our competitor is now using it. We can't have that. You need to stop this. Like, no, we, we agree on the license that this was supposed to happen, and this could happen, and now it has happened. So this is a lot of, like, crisis management, but at some point, I found a real hack in, like, the, the regulated industry, sometimes around it. As long as you have an executive sponsor, preferably the CTO, to get him, basically, most of the <coughs> regulated things actually don't dictate the implementation. So there's, there's like regulation and there's the implementation of that regulation. And in the implementation regulation, because it's a business most of the time, there's loopholes. You just need to be able to spot the loopholes that are there. And one of the common most loopholes is basically a C-level executive can just write a piece of paper and says, I say so, and I take Hadley responsibility. 
you shouldn't use that always, but in some cases, it's uh, because how regulations are interpreted is from company to company different. Regulations don't dictate that you have to do something in a very particular way. They just usually say, I want to have an artifact of this. How that artifact looks like or how the process looks like is up to the interpretation of the individual organization. Yeah, I can, I can add that, uh, an example. It's a, it's a bit of a different angle in the, in the answer. Uh, but we use quite a bit of weather data for specific use cases in, in, in the grid. For example, a solar irradiance on solar panels or the temperature of the ground uh, if, if cables are overloaded. But then trying to set up an open source project means that there might be different use cases outside of uh, grid operators' context. And so it, it's really uncomfortable and, and we don't also have the network in place to really contact other organizations outside of our industry. Uh, I think that is um, a, a real challenge we were facing because then uh, this also feels like limitless. Where do you end? Um, if we get a couple of grid operators on board, we have sufficient uh, support to actually get this project off the ground. And sure, it would be nice to even go further, make it more abstract. But at a certain point, you're building something so abstract and so universal that maybe you lose uh, the, the, the point of your main use case. So I think that's a challenge. So where do you put the boundary uh, of your effort? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I'd like to build on both of those, those points to talk about that power, strength, and numbers. So understanding that perhaps that, that collaborating, collaborating with a group of folks that have a similar goal may not always get you to the very specific use case, but there are lots of instances where um, when you bring together folks that are in that regulated industry under an umbrella, like for example, the Linux Foundation. So I've also been involved in the FinOS inner source special interest group. And I think one of the really interesting things about seeing all those financial institutions come together is that by coming together, A, they get the permission to do what they need to do in terms of collaborations because they've, they've, they've built the system under which they can collaborate. Um, but um, secondly, they can also, by, by working together, they can create a new so social norm about how that collaboration happens and the fact that it can happen through open source. So, so if it's the case that there's a, an industry that is set in doing it in the old way that isn't open source, by perhaps joining together with a group of people who figure out how to do it together, um, then, then, you, then you immediately have a, a, a kind of a network effect where people are kind of going, this is the cool way to do it. Look at all these guys over here. They're all working together quite effectively. Why can't we just copy that system of collaboration? It's worked in a regulated industry here. Could we not just copy that in terms of a model of collaborating in a second place? So again, it's not an individual justification within an organization. It's kind of a industry um, movement that you can point to, which can be very helpful in moving the needle. Yeah, I think Venus is a great example of open collaboration of fintech industries and financial industries gathering together to build common solutions uh, that helps all. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, you are engaging, the panelists here are engaging with other kinds of uh, foundations or projects in LF, outside LF, uh, that have like make have the same purpose, but maybe on different industries. So well, in LF, I'm in doing Finos and I'm doing Bitcom. Um, this is actually the funny thing when you see for like how the same regulation on the US side, how the Germans <laughs> would interpret it, and how the U in UK it gets interpreted. And for instance, a, a very tr funny thing is like uh, this matter. Zoom or any video conferencing system is used a lot, again, to virtually participate and, and collaborate. The Germans are fine of using the text feature that's like in Teams or Zoom to communicate and chat. And the UK, it's like, no, we can't, we can't use this. So I was really funny when I saw the different collaborations that I'm in to be, hang on, how can in Finance you can do it? But when we do it in Germany, we can't. And there's also vice versa different. And I was like, so I was t talking to one of the, f the to Rob, one of the, the Finos guys, like, I, I, I don't get it. Like how, yeah, we fixed it uh, because we got so annoyed by it that everybody just uh, said like, we need the chat feature. And even as simple as why, why we do this, when the meeting happens, the first thing you write down is like, like hi, I'm Thomas, I'm doing this. Completely innocent. but. In financial, for people that don't know from where, when you work in a financial institution, every communication needs to be tracked and recorded. 
so that there's no like hidden transactions there's no we're not scheming together to get stocks cheaper or anything and like that's just the law but the interpretation of the law is is is, is different and then i learned that finos for instance they say we don't use it and I think in the Netherlands, basically, they found a vector to, to just do the auto transcribe and they commit that into the GitHub repository. So, different industries, different ways. But yeah, in the end, I try to then, because I'm trying to then, like, hey, we're doing it this there and we're doing it there. And like Deutsche Bank is both in Bitcom and it's in Finos. I'm like, can we fix this? Yeah, and uh, uh, outside of the energy sector, uh, we now find quite a f uh, great support and collaboration in the public sector in the Netherlands as well. And really trying, to, because we're in a way we're all pioneering in, in uh, the public sector in the Netherlands, trying to move open source forward, make it more professional and substantial. Um, uh, to, and then you're talking about geospatial experts at the cadaster in the Netherlands. You're talking about the tax office having all different kinds of use cases but the, um, all being publicly funded, at least, are we not? We have a dis different position as a grid operator, um, uh, but at least we are there for society, and so we have at least a moral standard to abide by, and that is something we, we find each other in and uh, that we can collaborate on. Um, I think we are now gonna play like the other panelist that was here, uh, that is Remy. Uh, he will just introduce himself. He comes from uh, the government sector, so he, we will uh, see that in a bit. And then we will also introduce to one interesting challenge that I think we, we didn't men name it, but we mentioned that is the inner source. Uh, and from then we can, we can move on. So hope it works. My name is Remy de Cosmaker. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I am currently the open source lead here at the digital service at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, we have a goal of improving the design of healthcare experiences, delivering value to government providers and patients, modernizing systems, and participating in development. So this is my first time being in a public sector role, but this is not my first OSPO. Prior to this, I helped to stand up the OSPO over at Spotify. I was the head of open source over at Twitter. I was in the open source and standards team over at Red Hat as the Fedora community lead back before they called it an OSPO. And prior to that, I was at the Rochester Institute of Technology, where I was the assistant director of the Lab for Technological Literacy, whereas now they're the open at RIT OSPO, where they have the first academic minor in open source in the United States. Nonprofit, for profit, government, uh, always the common thread is helping contributors to work together to use their powers for good. Have you been facing unique challenge you would like to highlight when starting in your current OSPO that maybe you haven't faced in industry OSPO? There are some subtle differences for sure. We'll get into them in a second. But generally speaking, an open source program office tends to just balance engineering, business and legal stakeholder interests who all have their own roles and their own goals and are oftentimes making trade-offs between speed, quality, and risk. So an OSPO really works to make sure that those folks are aware of each other to help align their goals and to reduce the amount of friction. I think one of the primary differences is scale. As of 2022, roughly 12% of the federal budget goes to CMS. About 20% of national healthcare spending in the United States is Medicare spending. We serve 65 million Medicare beneficiaries, 88 million Medicaid beneficiaries, and 30 one million users on healthcare.gov. So uh, not only do we have a lot of people working here, but there are many, many more contractors for every full-time employee that work here. So instead of there being one legal department, one IT department, one procurement department, you have silos and lots of silos, an entire tapestry of interlocking and interrelated optives or operational divisions as we call them. We start sort of with CMS in the center, and we are part of the Department of Health and Human Services, which is itself part of the federal government, which is then in the context of the entire open source community. So at each of those layers, we need to be thinking about strategies of how we are aligning those incentives, how we're helping to represent those strategies, how we're working to align the policies. So I would say that uh, public sector tends to be on the conservative side of uh, appetite for risk. When someone asks you, you know, 
can you show us where in the United States code or what piece of legislation gives you the authority to touch this data or to do this type of work? Uh, that's a question I've never really had in other OSPOs. Congress has never been a blocker necessarily for the work that I've done before. It is a very interesting place to be doing work and it's a little bit different doing it in the public sector, but I am really enjoying the challenges. Thanks for that, Remy. We talked earlier about how inner source can sometimes be one element in, I suppose, a set of strategies to actually get you to an open source culture. So maybe can you give us a little bit of an indication about where that might come in or how you tackle the challenge of getting people ready to collaborate in that regulated environment you work in. Yes. And, you know, a lot of close collaboration, that sort of inner source style work does happen in the federal government. And when we think about the spectrum of collaboration that happens, we have to think about maturity models and really considering what the goals of your project or your organization are. We have sort of four levels. Level one is just sort of transparency. We want the work to be out there so people can see it. There's not a real expectation of there being sort of a two-way contribution. It's just meant to be out there so that there's people know what's there. The second level is close collaboration. So a government team or a team of contractors want to work together across the agency or across divisions. And that oftentimes looks a lot like that inner source model. So we want to both provide guidance on how to do that, as well as resources like templates for your repo or actions that you can run inside of your GitHub instance or CI to help you use and utilize some of the best practices that we see in open source development. So you get a lot of the benefits of moving quickly and having assurance and adhering to standards. Level three is more of like the, we want to work in the open. We want to be sharing things on GitHub or out in the wide world. Um, but due to a variety of, you know, constraints, whether it be regulatory on sort of like, this is a government led project that's defined in legislation. And so, you know, open governance may or may not be a good fit for doing that kind of stuff, but we still want to do things like have a con contributors.md and have, you know, secret scanning and a lot of the other sort of best open source practices there. And then occasionally we actually have projects at that level four level who are really out there to be, you know, open governance, open planning, open road mapping, um, and doing that type of work out in the wide open. It's not linear, right? It's more of like a choose your own adventure. That's where open source fits or inner source fits into this sort of wider open source strategy. Uh, and we're working out how that fits into the wider open source strategy, not just at CMS, but at HHS, the federal government, and in the context of open source generally. Thank you. And hopefully in the context of the world, because I'm, I'm only imagining that the work that you do will have great impact across the world. So thank you for that. If we're going to tackle some of the biggest, most complex problems in healthcare, then uh, we're going to need all the help we can get. It's exciting to see groups like the World Health Organization, the United Nations, you know, all of these like international organizations are starting to embrace OSPOs and open source program development as a strategy. So as we all come together around this way of tackling the complexity of developing code together, uh, we want CMS to be a leader and to be ready to answer the call and work with our partners inside and outside of the United States. Well, thank you to Remy, um, who couldn't be with us here today. And indeed, thank you to past Anna and past Claire for asking the questions. But, uh, um, but when, when we were there talking to Remy, uh, we, we, we got on to earlier the, the, this topic of inner source. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the concept, it's the use of open source practices within organizations to create proprietary code. But it's often used as a step on the path to open source readiness because it tackles that problem that we touched on earlier, which is around the culture change that is needed um, when people are used to working in silos, when they're used to working in maybe competitive environments. To move to this standardized way of collaborating can be quite a challenge. But as Remy mentioned, um, sometimes helping, in particularly in regulated organizations, get used to that way of working, perhaps before they go fully open, can sometimes be a, a tactic in terms of getting people to that open state. So I'm, I'm now gonna ask again for folks to maybe comment about either their thoughts about how this could be used uh, as a tactic or indeed how you tackle this, this challenge of the culture change required to get people working, collaborating openly. Yeah, I, th I think we have a, a great example of I mean, Aliando, which is now open source, but it, it wasn't in the past. This is the Power Grid model uh, application. 
is used for power system analysis, basically doing calculations on grids. And this is very important to us. And we developed our own methodology that's a bit faster over time. And it used to be that it was in R, on an R server, and it's more like a service. People, all the, the data scientists were working with it, but using it as is, because somebody else put the code in place and they could just refer to it. Um, what happened is it, the, the code got changed and it became a library, uh, an inner source library. People could actually uh, uh, contribute to the code. And um, all of these data scientists now were taking this library, adopting it, and we're finding um, maybe bugs or ways of improvement, especially on the, on the API level. And they got involved and they uh, made issues, they made uh, pull requests, and so it became a, a culture of contribution rather than just consumption. And um, then when we actually open sourced it and got other companies involved to, uh, to further this uh, development, we already had a, a good user base that had a good understanding of the code, how to use it. And so when we have now uh, regular meetups where we invite other organizations and to, to discover use cases and set a, a roadmap, we have, uh, I think, tens of uh, internal people, data scientists, that have real knowledge on putting this to practice and have a good understanding, and they are also now advocates for this library and its use cases. So it's really a ramp up to, to build a community. Well, thank, you, thank you, Nico. Tell us, I know you've got experiences as well in terms of that pathway. Yeah, so we, we had a problem basically, and again, in regulated industry, you have a lot of these product liabilities. And product li if you use open source, there's open source licensing. And the standard way of a lot of people were, and it, just for people to know, there's two ways about to look at licensing. There's kind of the sticker on the outside of the box, and that's what's actually inside of the source code. I can tell you that basically most open source projects have a way more complex licensing inside than what maybe the, the sticker, the metadata, or the license in the root of the file actually says. So we had this problem. We actually need to comply with the open source licenses. And there's actually, if we don't, there are big penalties to the point that like if we mess up in a car, and the car cannot be updated, it means we have recalled the car. So every car has to be called back to the garage, and they need to plug in a USB stick and update the software if there's a licensing problem. So we need to do this properly. So now we had this problem that, okay, by the old ways of working, every unit had to do their own license compliance. And they had to do check by check by check, which took like forever. And we're talking big code places with like lots and lots of licensings in there. Like, Having more than 800 open source licenses in an in open source project is not uncommon. But then we were like, hang on, hang on. The way how we work in automotive, we do these programs. So basically when a car is being built, a program is being started, and then they have a certain group that works in the program. And a new model comes out, new car, new model. But the software stack in our company, it was actually the same tree. So I was like, hang on, this makes no sense. We are using the same software. We should be able to clear this once and then figure this out. But this is a m tremendous amount of work that we need to clear, and there's all those variations very complicated. So we developed basically tooling that would not just basically, but a lot of scanners that they notify you have a licensing problem. And then, the, but you know what most developers do when they get a notification? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I call this the notify and ignore workflow. And so like, we cannot do this because, uh, yeah, the, the problem, like, our customers are educated. They, they will spot the licensing problems, right? So what we did is we built tooling that when a license is popped up, that we, we enable the developers to fix it by themselves. And they contribute to this central code repository to the fix. What we reality were doing, we're doing license compliance with inner source. And all of the source, so when a piece of piece was cleared and then the license was like clarified, you might think, what, what does it mean license clearance? Well, it's very simple. Sometimes an open source piece of code, you might have a license choice. But the scanner is not clever enough to recognize that. So these days you see MIT, GPL, a permissive license, and a copyleft license. Generally, most automotive companies prefer permissive. So we need to encode this. And we need to encode this, well, most of the time, think of it 100,000 times. So how do you eat an elephant? Bite by bite, team by team. So we set up this process. And we literally say, like, oh, you fix this, and you contribute it. And this is shared across the whole company. So bit by bit, people, at the beginning they got messed up, but the open source office, we started helping them, and they got it more and more right. And then the funny thing is, we, want to, we did a migration to GitLab, and they had to, we need to build, oh, we need to build a new CI CD stack. We need to, how, how do we do it in the old way, do it in the new way? And then the guys were just like, the engineering team was like, hang on, we just did for license clearance, we, we work together on like, just building this together. Why don't we do the same thing that we do for license compliance, 
actually to do the GitLab rollout. And just whenever we need a particular functionality, we just have one code repository and everybody from the company just contributes how they, for instance, add the security report to deliver. Again, remember highly regulated industry, when you build software, you need to find tons of proof included that like, yes, we did this tech, yeah, yes, we did all of that stuff. And everybody previously was reinventing that. What if we just work together? Because again, GitLab, we have one platform instead of the multiple beforehand, multiple tools. So yeah, this is how inadvertently we got InnoSource, but this is actually funny. We didn't call it InnoSource. It was called the Open Contribution Model. Fun fact, you know why that was? Because regulated industry believes in Gartner. And Gartner didn't have the word inner source, but luckily since recent. Well, I'm <laughs> happy to report that the recent Gartner developer experience uh, report does in fact call out inner source as a major development trend. So that can be used in future if for anyone who wants to justify that. But thank you, Thomas, because I think like what I'm hearing is that, that for example, in a regulated industry, um, it can be easier to get people used to doing contributions when they're not doing contributions to open source. You can get more people doing that so that they are ready when the time comes to actually do the open source contributions and understand how that all works. So that's fantastic. And Anna, I know you too have had experience in terms of how the open source program offices you work with are yeah. actually potentially looking at this culture change problem as well. Yeah, actually, so we, in the, uh, in the community I'm, I'm engaging in, I've seen a lot of OSPOs having inner source programs or even the ESPO, so inner source program offices, as uh, an, a, another, like department or team in charge of these challenges or this l progression that Remy was mentioning, like it's not linear, but well, there will be projects that they cannot go open source, they are not ready yet because there are a lot of restrictions or uh, there is lack of culture on collaboration, but there will be others that they are ready to go open source. Not, not everything needs to be open source and I think that is something something that we forget, right? Like when we talk about open source for organizations, some organizations are afraid or, or they, they are like, oh, yeah, then everything is gonna be open. Like, no, it's, it depends on your organization's goals and uh, the, the culture that that organization has. And it's okay if there are some open source projects that are open source, fully open source, all the others just like are doc share the documentation are open, others are in our source and or they practice uh, uh, in our source principles. Uh, and I think that, that it's important to, to, to highlight here that uh, every organization, there are not, OSP, not two OSPOs alike. Every organization is different. And when we are talking about regulated industries, each organization has their own standards and their own specifications. And, and, and that makes that uh, process so unique. I think one of the main challenges or something that is important is look at your organization's strategy and goals and always and all times, even though you decide to open source or not, make sure the open source strategy or the open source initiatives are aligned with those goals. And I think that it's that, that is what, what needs to be always on top of mind when deciding whatever. Thank you. And do we want to actually open up the questions? Before yeah, uh, so actually we discussed like to make like an open discussion here and feel free to say whatever. This is a secure space. This is something where everyone can, 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 can decide because this, we, we don't know the answer and we would like to ask you. Uh, we were discussing about uh, standards and uh, specifications and uh, projects uh, in when developing solutions in the industry. And we wanted to ask you, what comes first, standards or project developments? Um, so I think that, that is the question I would like to ask. What, what, has, what, what have you faced in your specific industries? And if you want to share any um, experience on that. Or feel free to ask us an alternative question if, you, <laughs> if that one doesn't tickle your fancy. Carl, uh, wait, you got a mic. So I usually work for the mobile industry, and then four years ago I was doing the Volvo cars, so now it's a 
completely new industry. And I discovered there that there seems to be, generally, I don't know, but there seems to be some kind of uh, fear in the automotive industry. And Thomas maybe can help me on this. To, oh, we cannot be seen as being trusting together. So, I mean, there are antitrust measures in, in the industry. Um, but as far as I know, working together collaboratively in an open source organization, that is not seen as uh, violating any antitrust rules. How is it in the financial industry? Do you have also antitrust rules? There same. are indeed, yet yeah, the same. The, the uh, same, the same are there. There are even, having now both worked in both industry, I kind of feel actually in the financial industry there is actually a lot more heaviness than in the automotive industry. No, it's actually very funny. So, on the automotive industry, it's there, so basically they don't kill people. And <laughs> the financial services industry is so they don't lose your money. Again, this is very blunt, but it's it's really like for, on the financial side, they have a lot more regular so Like, you get these things like, you can't use GitHub. Like, GitHub is physically blocked within the organization. Like, I've never ever seen that in an automotive company. It's like always, always available. But vice versa, there are other rules where you're like, okay, this is this way. So, yes, antitrust does come up and, and we have to work around it. Uh, but, yes, uh, there, there are ways it just said. I don't know, like, especially, it has, I think most if you look at the car companies, we have the German car industry, like the traditional way, and we have the J French and Japanese. You don't forget that these companies have, like, what, minimum, how many Mercedes is, how old is Mercedes? 100 plus years? Yeah, uh, Mercedes, how old is Mercedes? Like, oh, sorry, uh, 86. Yeah, so again, there are very old companies that have been doing things for a long time, and also when you look at software, the default was always like, ev we write everything in-house, or we have a contractor with Poker writing this for us. And therefore, it's not a problem. We do everything ourselves. And now in the modern world, basically, this is kind of like, I don't remember, I think it was your Mercedes's chief software officer, he said like, not using open source was like commercial software. I don't remember exactly the quote, but he has a really nice quote. Sorry, where he has a quote, not using open source is like commercial suicide. Like, you can't go without open source. I'm trying to remember. I should have looked up the quote before. Yeah, without open source, without software yeah, without open source. So, is that, is that, did, so <laughs> no, I think you're more so right. So, this is, the way, this is the thing, but you remember, like, these are big companies with distributed teams, and there's one way how to think about regulation. And now you basically have to change that. You're, and again, these are long term, comp like, very old, and not say old and bad. I, I've been to all of them. They're actually, uh, Mercedes is a very modern organization, but, but remember, there's like, things have been done in a particular way in a long time. It's, it's, mass, it's, it's basically what is a business process, manage, change management yeah. at a massive scale, basically, that you have to do. And, and I think then it, sh it points to the value of, of, of organizations that can bring together people who are in that similar situation. So every individual organization is going to hit these, but we've always done it this way, kind of. Um, blocker and the fear, the fear that they don't want to be the poppy with the, the tall poppy saying, I'm doing it differently. But when you bring together a group of organizations, knowing the antitrust scenarios and working within that context to find a workable solution for how collaboration can happen, it can be very, very powerful. And that's happened in the fin financial industry through Finos. I, I'm sure there are other, you know, other foundations as well, but it's happened in the automotive industry in terms of the, you know, they've got a template for how that works in the in the automotive. I can't remember the project name, but it's um, in that area. Eclipse uh, SDV. And there you go, another one there. So, so this is this is happening, but it rarely happens with one company figuring it out by themselves. It can only happen, I think, or at least it e more easily happens and you get over the fear when people are coming with it together. Because then you're at least kind of going, well, we're not the only ones. You know, we're, 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 we figure this out together and we have consensus that this is approach that's both safe and responsible. But I mean, it, it was a shock to my system anyway. Every Finos meeting, we actually had the antitrust laws being presented and we all had to stare at it for a few seconds and like nod or screen or something like that. You know, kind of like, does everyone agree with this? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, we're gonna be very careful, very careful. <laughs> <laughs> so speak about the fear, but we get over that. <laughs> uh, I have a related question. Um, so in Europe, we know this, um, you know, um, Cyber Resilience Act and AI Act all coming and then uh, especially with the emerging GAI, we see, you know, lawmakers are starting to get more engaged with the tech industry and then looking into open source. 
And I wonder, Ospos, is, is there any, uh, can Ospos take on a role of, you know, working with companies, government, government relations, and help, you know, communication with the lawmakers? So in that sense that we can stay ahead of the game instead of being reactive to what's being made for us. Um, I, I just wanted to mention, so in the Twitter group, we just released a survey, a study on the status of OSPOS for this year. We have been keeping this in the past six years or so to try to get a pulse on the status of OSPOS and what value are open source prom offices doing worldwide. Uh, so one of uh, the, the insights uh, is that I think we, we found out that from all the respondents, 90%, I, I, I need to check out though, so, but I think like the majority of OSPOs uh, had a clear policies and processes on open source and they were helping and supporting um, the security team and uh, even like the yeah security and CISO team on all this um, on risk management and so on. So they are basically acting more as the support team for sustainability and security, and they should be I, I think like eventually the the value that the Anospo can give is being these advisors of open source because open source is everywhere and uh, to meet with these policymakers or to engage with these policymakers and the stakeholders to integrate open source. It's not, open source is not a siloed thing that you should only have it because it's innovative. It's a risk uh, management critical asset. And I think Thomas, uh, everyone here has mentioned it in, in different way, but that is a really important assessment, we, maybe that is the message we need to, to give now, now that we are seeing more OSPOs popping up. And yes, OSPOs are becoming mainstream, but we need to maintain those OSPOs. We need to um, keep this value of the OSPOs and understand that they are the as advisors because they have this open source knowledge, the teams, the people behind the OSPO. I'm not talking about the entity itself, but the people that are behind, the ones that have the expertise and that act as these supporters and knows how uh, around open source policies and can advise on that. Maybe instead of the word open source, if you look at now AI and AI regulation and all those stuff that comes, AI is very tricky because you have copyright questions, you have uh, like who owns things, we have but it completely business disrupted. Instead of the word open source, think of your OSPO as the knowledge center that works on the, the junction between business, technology, people and legal. And you won't find that often in companies. So that's how I explain some of the executives. Be like, yeah, they might look open source. Open source is all free. I, we don't care about. It. Like, no, these are the people that know that interjunction, especially with AI. What I now seeing, we recently had a uh, osology session about this. Uh, you can find it on the to do YouTube channel. Like, now you're seeing OSPOs instead of like being like the compliance department. They were actually being asked to go forward to be like, no, 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 uh, OSPO, can you just? help us here with this AI discussion. How is this forward looking? So it's coming from like reactive, like operational now to corporate process development, like what should we do? And you might wonder like how, how does it, well exactly because they have these questions. But if you look at also at the AI models, this is all rapidly community and they're like, which AI models should we use? Which community should we in like? And the, for the leadership, it was at some point they were like, oh, hang on, we need to go to our OSPOs because our OSPOs actually know this topic. They have worked in this before. They might not have worked in AI, but they understand, hopefully, communities. They understand things at the compliant aspect. So, and they know how to do this intersection between. Yeah, basically that. And, and um, I, my time is spent 50% on the OSPO and 50% on the team that looks after the quality of everything we built ourselves looking at what do we have in-house in terms of software and adding to that AI and algorithms and getting a grip on that. Yeah, it's pretty much the same as getting license compliance in a way, right? There, there's, there's subtle differences, but a, a lot of that um, can be carried over. Uh, also, I find that OSPOs um, are outward facing and very easy to make uh, an, a, an open collaboration and get into contact with. Um, and that's why also um, an organization, we are already starting now to, to, category, to see what do we have in-house in terms of algorithms, AI, because there was an initiative by the Dutch government, uh, first by the municipalities, to come up with an algorithmic register. 
And this was a very open process, and it was on the horizon of the, of the OSPO. And we went to just a meeting to see, oh, what's going on here? Maybe we can participate and learn something. And I think that's also um, something that an OSPO can do, is really just go somewhere and meet the people and really get a, a good relationship going that you then can build on um, further. Um, I'm sorry, we are out of time, but um, yeah, I think we can find us in case you want to reach out here at Open Source Summit, and we will be more than happy to answer or discuss and take a coffee together. So yeah, thank you so much for your time, and see you around.